how do chemicals in our environment interact with our bodies and our cells and how does it affect our health? You worked in the flavor and fragrance industry. I wanna know what made you decide to do that and I also wanna know what you learned in your time working in that industry. Well, we know for a fact that these flavors and fragrances, they definitely interact with our brain chemistry. So you can get a hit of dopamine by smelling certain things. They can trigger memories. They're very potent and very powerful. Dr. Yvonne Burkhardt is a board certified toxicologist. She's a 22 year veteran of toxicology with expertise in reproductive toxicity, particularly endocrine disruption, infertility, and cancer. She has also served as a senior toxicologist in the flavor and fragrance chemistry industry, where she helped to ensure the safety of flavor ingredients. I've got to ask you about your superhero origin story because your expertise is really exceptional. And I'm, as I was saying before we got started, I'm so excited to have you here truly because you have this very diverse background. But my question is who gets introduced or interested in toxicology in the first place like what got you interested in that field i actually stumbled on it kind of serendipitously i guess you could say because i was a college student studying biology and i was looking for a summer job so i got this grant to get a summer job and i found this toxicology lab and i was actually looking to work with a woman professor i was just really into women's empowerment. And so I started working with her and she was doing research on toxicology and I just became extremely fascinated by it. I was helping her just doing, you know, dishes and helping maintain the lab equipment. So I wasn't even doing research, but it, I really got obsessed just watching what she was doing. Interesting. So because you were saying, you know, just off camera, how you had an opportunity to take a different track and in going into pharmacology and a lot of your peers were doing that. So you made a decision to go towards toxicology, um, but why'd you make that decision? Why didn't you go down the pharma route? Yeah, I was actually interested in several different things. So toxicology was definitely at the top, but part of me also wanted to go into medicine. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to, into pharmacology and that kind of work, but really toxicology just captivated me because it's so applicable to daily life. Yeah. And I didn't feel that same connection with the other fields. I just feel so passionate about learning how do chemicals in our environment interact with our bodies and our cells and how does it affect our health? So is that what toxicology really is at its core? Exactly. It's really the safety science. It's studying how do chemicals interact with the body and how can we use this information to inform our decisions. Now. Because of the word toxic being so overused or toxins, I think that sometimes people can put up a little bit of a force field and kind of ignore in many ways the kind of toxic elements in our environment or also our, bo our body's interaction with toxins and metabolic waste products and all this different stuff. But we live in a very different environment right now than our ancestors evolved in. And so this is why your work is so important because you can start to highlight like, okay, I know we, we got this new invention called plastics. Here's how it's impacting our biology. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's start with plastics, right? So first of all, where the hell do plastics come from? And what is the potential implications with how we're interacting with them? Plastics essentially come from crude oil, which is the same starting material that creates gasoline for cars. It's just used in a different way and creates these synthetic polymers that don't exist in the environment. So it creates these very versatile, as we know, plastics are everywhere. You can't avoid them anymore. But it's come to the point now where plastics are not made the same way that they were when they were created back decades ago, where they break down into tiny fragments called microplastics and eventually into nanoplastics. And these are one of the most persistent environmental pollutants, they're literally everywhere. You can't avoid them anymore. So that's, it's basically becoming an epidemic. It's, you, you've seen pictures of those plastic islands in the ocean. You see how much plastic is washing ashore, the disposable masks, the, all of the things that we have been using in the last even few years have just created just mountains and mountains of this waste that we can't get rid of. Yeah, and of course the thing is, we can start off with good intentions with something like plastics. And I think back to, you know, some of the things that we would have prior to plastics being so integral in our environment or in our culture and things like 
frames for people's glasses or, um, you know, b things that we're brushing our teeth with. You know, they might have been made of like wood or ivory and things like that. So everything is coming from the earth in some form or fashion. We're not like off in outer space grabbing materials just yet, which maybe they are. I don't know. But plastics are a little bit different. This is something that is very malleable, can be made into a bunch of stuff. And because of the way that our industry is structured, it's very cheap. So it came in and replaced so many different things. And because of its now kind of really deeply integrated into our culture, we're always touching plastic. We're always in touch with it some kind of a way. So what are the big concerns with plastic? Let's start with our food packaging and beverage packaging, for example. So some of the main concerns will be that they're leaching plasticizer chemicals. So plastic in and of itself is a hard material and it needs to become malleable with the addition of plasticizer chemicals such as bisphenols, phthalates. These are very commonly used plasticizer chemicals. The problem is that they are estrogenic. So when they interact with our body, it has an estrogenic effect, a hormone effect in the body, which is not a positive attribute. The thing is that we can't avoid plastic, like you said, like there's definitely some pros to plastics that we can't avoid, like tubing that's used for medical procedures and things like that, where maybe there wasn't another alternative before. So there's definitely use cases for plastic. But when it comes to food packaging in particular, they're usually single use plastic. People are heating them, heating foods in them, and that's going to increase the leaching of these chemicals. We're ingesting these chemicals, and even though some of them might be metabolized quickly, we're exposed continuously, yeah. day in and day out. Yeah, one of the studies that just came out was looking at microwaving your food in plastics, and you know, just like, I think it was a three, actually we'll put the study up for everybody to see, but it was a three centimeter space of the food container, this quote, microwave safe plastic, and it was leaching billions of nanoplastics into the food within three minutes of cooking and millions of microplastics. And that was just from a three centimeter space in which is, you know, these containers can be much more than three centimeters. And so again, this is getting into our food and it's getting into our bodies. And now you're answering the question, being somebody who works in this field, this is interacting with our cells, our receptor sites for hormones, namely for estrogen, and basically being able to turn on processes related to estrogen. And you mentioned BPA, for example, and being something that can kind of soften the plastic, make it more malleable. Now, the thing is, and even yesterday, I just took a flight and I, I find a you know pla plastic bottle that says BPA free. So is that good enough? Is that going to save us from this interaction with plastics? Unfortunately, BPA free is just the tip of the iceberg. It's it's almost, I would borderline think of it as a scam because BPA is only one type of plasticizer. There's so many plasticizer chemicals just in the BP family. There's BPB, BPF, BPS. There's so many different types. So BPA is just one of them and that's not good enough. So I said health washing, right? Framing it a certain way so that it looks like, oh, this is safe, it's BPA free. Because when I posted about that particular thing with the you know, the study with the microplastics and nanoplastics, in particular in in bottles for babies, for infants. And, you know, folks are like, well, it's if it's BPA free, then what's the big deal? You know, it's just, again, it's just, it's, we get this kind of like superficial thing and we want to trust, we want to think that things are safe. And also we don't want to feel guilty if we have used these things unknowingly. But that's just, you know, this is another reason I'm happy to have you here is that a lot of stuff we just don't know. and let's not ignore this let's get educated about it and we don't have to be neurotic but we do need to be more intentional today than ever because there's a lot of things that are impacting our families we might not be aware of so what are some of those other things like for you what are some of the bigger concerns for families today in our kind of current environment generally speaking it's overall the endocrine disruption Kids are getting puberty earlier. We're seeing diseases that are arising later in life because of early life exposures or in utero exposures to these plasticizer chemicals. The rates of infertility are through the roof. Kids are coming down with cognitive impairment. There's just higher rates of disease in the younger population than we've ever seen before. And cancer is also one of them too. I personally know of two people 
two women that had cancer in their early 30s, breast cancer. And this was decades ago was unheard of. Yeah. Cancer generally turns up 20, 30 years after exposure began. So who knows what triggered this cancer in these young women? But we're seeing more and more cases every day. Yeah. And the thing is, I'm a big fan of looking at the results. Something is seriously awry right now where we're seeing these disease states again in early and earlier populations. And it's our spo exposure really is happening so much earlier. And many of us, we grew up with certain things that just today they're normalized, but they might not have even been around yet. Uh, one of those is like <laughs> Roundup has been getting a lot of attention recently, glyphosate. And me being from St. Louis, Monsanto is, you know, is home base there. And so they would come to the job fairs at my university. And it's just like, I wanted to work there. And, you know, it's like, get a good job at Monsanto. But glyphosate has been affirmed by the WHO even, you know, one of these bigger entities as a class 2A carcinogen. So this means it probably causes cancer in humans. We don't know for sure, but probably. And just look at the amount of exposure that we get though, because it's often, it's not just the, the toxin, it's the exposure, like how much we're getting exposed to. And in my new book, I cited a study by the Environmental Working Group, and they just looked at conventional uh, products on store shelves, and they found upwards of 80 to 90% of conventional grain products were contaminated with glyphosate. So it's just like, again, this is a probable carcinogen. We're getting all this exposure, and this is something that wasn't around a few decades ago. And so this is what you're pointing to is like, the environment is very different right now, and we need to be aware of these things because we're probably getting exposed to a plethora of different carcinogens. And so I just mentioned this interaction with plastics. And one of the things you shared, and by the way, everybody needs to follow you seriously on Instagram. It's the best, it's so good. And what's your Instagram handle? Dr. Yvonne Burkhart. Dr. Yvonne Burkhart, all right, follow her. You shared about the plastic cups at like, you know, the, that you get like your coffee in at Starbucks. Let's talk about those. Well, everybody's out there with their to-go cups. I mean, they're so convenient. But if you think about it, just take a step back. I didn't even question this myself too heavily until fairly recently either, is how do things work? A paper cup by nature should absorb water. If it's not absorbing water, then that means there must be something, a barrier in between the paper and the liquid. And that barrier is polyethylene plastic. If you think about it, a hot liquid should increase the amount of basically melting the plastic. It's melting that layer of plastic into your drink. And not to mention the lid on that plastic cup is also melting plastic as you drink through it. There are several different factors that will affect how much is leaching and how many microplastics are being released, such as the heat, the duration of contact, the pH. So if you think about it, coffee is acidic. Coffee is hot. Most people don't drink their coffee in two or three minutes if it's boiling hot. So this, amount of time is allowing microplastics to leach. In fact, a study found that in 15 minutes of contact with hot liquids, leach 25,000 microplastic particles into your cup. And people drink more than one cup of coffee a day. People drink coffee every single day, all the time. But no one's questioning this. No one's really thinking about it because it's just part of our daily lives. So with that exposure again, is this, are we very good at like metabolizing plastics? No, plastic is a foreign body. It's a foreign particle. In fact, it'll break down into nanoplastics and nanoparticles in general have the issue of being able to penetrate cell membranes. So it can penetrate very deeply into the cell. It can cause inflammation. Your body doesn't know how to deal with it. It's a foreign object. So you'll get the inflammatory response when you encounter these. But to make things worse, the microplastics themselves are a foreign body, but they also release plasticizer chemicals when they're in contact with your body, and they can also carry toxic chemicals into your body. All right, so we know there's a couple of things here. The fact that they can basically invade and integrate into our cells, and you are what you eat, all right? So these plastics, are we turning into real life Barbie and Ken dolls? We could be because there's actually microplastics that have been detected in human lung, blood and placenta. And who knows how much of this is getting into babies? Are babies being born with plastic in their bodies? I would guesstimate yes, just based on the evidence. 
This is bananas. All right, so another reason, again, I'm very so happy to have you here is your diversity in education. You know, you have your conventional education and then you actually packed up, moved to Cincinnati for a while and you worked in the flavor and fragrance industry. I wanna know what made you decide to do that? And I also wanna know what you learned in your time uh, working in that industry. Well, I definitely knew that I didn't wanna go into working for the government, that didn't interest me, or any of the other industries, chemical industries that most toxicologists go into, like petrochemicals, agrochem, and so forth. And I came across this opportunity at this flavor company and it sounded different. I thought, okay, well, these are chemicals that are going into foods, how bad could they be? So let me just try it out. Once I was there, I started, I saw all the formulations of all the flavors. And what I'm talking about is if you look on your packaged food and you see the word flavor, natural flavor, these are the types of chemicals that I was working with. Just knowing that a scientist could cre recreate any flavor out there in the world and dissolve it in water, just plain water. You just look at that and think it's water, but drink it and it tastes like my favorite pho soup that I ate growing up. That was absolutely shocking to me. Just knowing that you could recapitulate such a complex flavor, but make it almost undetectable. Like, how is this working? And I thought to myself, this, this can't be good for our taste buds. It can't be good for our bodies. What is this doing to me? Is this making me want that type of flavored food over the actual food? And over time it did because it was so good. It was too good. It's chemically crafted that way, you know, and th that in particular, that kind of befuddlement with our flavor receptors and how we interact with food that we evolved with for hundreds of thousands of years. And suddenly we can take that chemical and add it to things that are not that thing, right? We could take the blueberry flavor and add it to things that are not blueberries. And it's starting to really invade in this really powerful adaptation that we've developed, which is something called post-ingestive feedback. So we eat that blueberry and our bodies get feedback associated with that flavor, which nutrients we're getting, right? And so, you know, maybe we get some selenium, we get some, you know, different anthocyanins, we get some, a couple of amino acids, vitamin C, whatever the case might be. And if we come, become deficient in any of those things, we can start to develop a little bit of craving, like that would drive us, let's, let me go eat some of these berries today. But now that metabolic water is getting muddied up, literally mentioning water, and we have this kind of confusion. And now we're craving things that are not that thing. We're craving things that are not natural or normal anymore. And not to mention just the flavor part, but also there's some other interesting things that are done by food scientists to kind of manipulate our brains and our chemistry. Like, um, you know, there's the, this vanishing caloric density and just how the food just kind of disappears when we're chewing it suddenly, like a Cheeto, you know, a couple bites and it's just like dissolving so quickly. So you working in with, with flavors and what about fragrances as well? So again, we're, we're making stuff smell like things that are not those things. How is that impacting us? Well, we know for a fact that these flavors and fragrances, they, they definitely interact with our brain chemistry. So. Mm -hmm you can get a hit of dopamine by smelling certain things. They can trigger memories. They're very potent and very powerful triggers for our sensory system. We are sensory beings. Yeah. So given that there's so many fragrances out there, our bodies are getting confused. And people's threshold for being able, to, and by the way, our sense of smell is a survival mechanism, right? You gotta be able to sniff out. Is there toxic gas leaking somewhere? I need to know this so that I can run away and survive. But now our systems are getting muddied and mm -hmm. there's just too much input and there's sensory overload. There's fragrances everywhere. Plugins, scented, everything. Perfume, fragrances in things that don't even need fragrances, like a fragrance lip product. Why do you need this? We should start to question this stuff. Why is there so much fragrance in everything? It's extremely overused in my opinion. Do you ever walk through the like fragrance section at like Macy's? I try my best to avoid it. I do not. <laughs> I try not to, to be it's honest. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. And also the ladies that come up with the spray and, hey, hey, come here, come here. You know? Um, yeah, that's bananas. 
So all of that kind of integration, and again, very sophisticated, especially human smell. Like that's why we our taste is so complex is because of our ability to smell things. And so all of this stuff is kind of invading. And this is so recent. But why do we need it? Part of it, people want stuff that smells good. All right. I was just on a walk and I picked up a pine cone and I smelled it was like, damn, it smells like pine saw, right? And I brought it back into my house and I had my my son, my youngest son smell it. Just like, it smells very, like, it smells like, a, it's a natural smell though, of pine. And my wife as well. And I'm just like, and as soon as my son, son smelled it, he was like, this smells like cleaning products, right? He's never smelled a pine cone before. So his association was cleaning products. But there's none of that. There's not actual pine fragrance itself from a natural source in the cleaning product, right? So we like stuff to smell good. And my question is, with all these different fragrances in our house and whatever whatever else could be affecting the indoor air quality, this is a huge concern right now. So let's talk about indoor air quality and... What about outdoor air quality? Like what, what is the comparison? Is one kind of worse than the other? Indoor air quality is much worse than outdoor air quality. So the EPA actually estimates that it could be three to five times worse indoor air quality than outdoor air quality. Five times worse? Yeah, up to five times worse. Why? People are not opening the windows. There's just not enough ventilation going on in the house. There's excess moisture leading to mold formation, mold growth and things like that. All of these things are being kicked up into the air that we breathe. Mm. Yeah, there is a lot of smells going on in the average house. So what what are some of the most pervasive things? You mentioned plug-ins earlier. Plug it in, plug it yeah. in. Let's talk about that. Scented plug-ins. Uh, okay, well, these are, of course, usually made out of synthetic undisclosed fragrances. And the term fragrance on a label can be an umbrella. It is an umbrella term because companies by law can use this as proprietary protection for their fragrance formulation. The International Fragrance Association or IFRA actually publishes a list of all of the possible chemicals that could be in that word fragrance. There's nearly 4,000 of them right now on that list. There's known carcinogens, there's endocrine disruptors, and fragrance chemicals are some of the most potent allergens known to man. These are all within this umbrella term of fragrance. So think of how many products that you're using that have fragrance in it. If you have these continuous release products like scented plugins, and then you're using the fabric or deodorizing spray, then you've got your scented laundry detergent, and you're not opening your windows. All of these volatile organic compounds, this is what the fragrance chemicals are. They have to volatize volatilize for you to be able to smell them, they're being trapped in your house if you don't open your windows and you're breathing them in. They attach to house dust and you recirculate them over and over and over. So I'm already hearing one of the solutions is to open your damn window. That's the, one of the <laughs> easiest things that you can do is open your windows. Of course, there's caveats to that nuances. If your outdoor air quality is not favorable, of course you don't want to let more pollution in, but it really depends where you live. If you live near a busy highway, you know, maybe consider getting an air purifier or, you know, you can DIY a HEPA box fan filter. That can help too. But you really don't want to create, you want to minimize creating the pollutants in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, most folks are not going to be living right by highway. And if you are right now, shout out to you. Um, you know, we all live in different conditions, but most of us, the out, as you mentioned, the outdoor air quality versus the indoor, indoor air quality is gonna be three to five times worse. So opening the window is going to be a free application for most people. And to upgrade even further, a high quality air filter, like an air doctor, for example, would, would be great. Also, it like does like this cool ion setting, you know, that kind of thing. And what, what are some other, I'm curious about this air quality thing because again, we're oftentimes just kind of boxed in with all this stuff. And you mentioned things like plugins. What about like when we're cooking as well? Like, is there anything there for us to be aware of? Yeah, cooking is actually one of the main sources of pollutants too, because anytime you're creating smoke, those are particles that you don't want to breathe in. So smoke contains 
carcinogens that are created just in the process of cooking. So it's not necessarily something to be alarmed about, but if you have a vent over your stovetop that vents outside, make sure that happens because I lived in a place where it vented back inside, which was completely worthless. It was <laughs> open a window, maybe blow a fan so that the fumes go outside. And of course, try not to burn your food. Yeah, we just shouldn't be burning your food anyway. Right. But <laughs> also again, just if we can get in a habit of just again, cracking a window open, um, and as you mentioned, being able to use that little fan, which a lot of us, a lot of modern ovens have a setting to turn the fan on. But again, making sure that it's not pulling stuff in, which is crazy. Um, so, and in particular, also there's some s certain things we were talking about this a little bit before we got started. Um, in the journal Inhalation Toxicology, they specifically identified vegetable oil, and that smoke point. Once it's when the fumes start happening when you're cooking it. And they found that it was damaging to DNA, for, to human DNA, which is crazy. Like we don't think about a smell causing harm literally at the level of our DNA. But inhalation is like a big, like that's how we interact with our environment in such a profound way, right? Yeah, inhalation is actually the most sensitive route of human exposure through daily life. It's only second to IV injection. Inhalation, you can very quickly you can die if you breathe in the wrong stuff very quickly as opposed to putting something on your skin or eating something inhalation is the easiest way to increase your toxic load if you are inhaling polluted air your body is polluted because these gases and these particles are very fine they can penetrate very deeply into the lungs where the alveoli are some are even just one cell layer thick these chemicals and these particles can enter your bloodstream and they go everywhere in your body all right, so the mission today is for us to take our breathing seriously. All right, shout out to Tony Braxton. We want to breathe again, but we want to breathe again better. Um, and just again, it's just, just it's about getting educated and looking at what are some of the cost effective things that we can do, you know, for right now, for the vast majority of us, just even opening a window occasionally, even if it's, you know, a winter month, like if you can crack the window, it, let a little bit, little bit of air in, at least sometime throughout the day you know that's one of the things that we would do even you know i live in missouri and there were some pretty strong winters but just like even cracking the window open you know for 20 minutes a day or something like that just to let in some fresh air and let some of that um kind of the toxicity that's built up in the household to be able to dissipate a little bit so <laughs> i gotta ask you about this one my, my oldest son is into candles right now Let's talk about candles. Ah, oh, candles. Everybody loves candles, especially around this time of the year. It starts to cool down. People are into the pumpkin spice, the apple, baked apple pie scented candles. I used to be into that too, so I totally get it. The problem is that most of these candles can contain these undisclosed fragrance chemicals, like I mentioned, the carcinogens, the endocrine disruptors, the allergens, not to mention the paraffin wax that they're made of that comes from the crude oil, the petroleum. Burning these creates toluene, benzene, formaldehyde, and ultrafine particles. You don't want to be breathing any of these in. Those are all carcinogens through the route of inhalation. All right. So the sexy vibe, we got to be more mindful of this with the candles. Are there any candles that are not toxic to us like that? Yeah, I did a lot of research on this and it was not easy to find information, but I looked into various plant waxes and beeswax. Mm -hmm. So based on my research, beeswax contains the least amount of pollutants, even though any type of combustion technically is creating pollutants, but beeswax created the least. So that's a good thing to know, right? It's, yeah. it's really about taking it back to what our ancestors used to do. Mm -hmm. Like all this new stuff, I've even seen these clear jelly candles, very odd. I'm, I'm positive they're made out of some petroleum ingredient that you don't want to be inhaling either just keep it simple go back to the basics you know beeswax candles i think people were hand dipping those for like centuries now you know it's it's not that hard yeah mind your beeswax that's right <laughs> <laughs> all right now one of the cool things that you've been talking about recently and again i want everybody to make sure they're following you on instagram because you keep people up to date with some of this stuff you've been talking a lot about glutathione all right so can you share first of all what is glutathione 
and let's talk about some of the roles that it plays in our bodies because I think that this can even help our bodies to be more resilient in the face of these things. Absolutely. Glutathione is known as a master, master antioxidant. It's basically made out of three amino acids, glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. It's very simple, but it can do so many things. It detoxifies these chemicals that I'm telling you about. It helps with detoxifying free radicals. So us breathing oxygen creates free radicals that glutathione neutralizes. So glutathione is one of the things that basically keeps us alive. And it keeps us young and it keeps us healthy. And there are so many chronic diseases that are linked with low glutathione levels. So this is like, you said it's a master level uh, antioxidant. So the question is like, is this something that we could just buy a glutathione supplement? Or is this something that we can do or improve our production of it internally with certain lifestyle factors? The second one. So you can buy glutathione supplements, but that isn't necessarily going to solve all your problems. So our bodies have glutathione in them. The highest levels are in the liver and the kidney. And the third is in the ovaries and the testes. That's how important it is. Interesting. So the liver and the kidneys detoxify chemicals, right? And then of course, our reproductive organs, they need to be protected too. That's like our third most precious organ if you look at just glutathione. But glutathione is made naturally in our bodies. You don't necessarily need to supplement with it. It's just that modern lifestyles often take away this vital antioxidant that we need just to survive. So just by avoiding toxins and lifestyle changes like your diet, exercise, sleep, reducing stress, all of these things can actually help to maintain glutathione balance because we can, our cells recycle glutathione. You don't always need to make new glutathione. Don't deplete it and help your body recycle it. It's very simple actually, if you think about it. So all of the things that I've heard you talk about that just are the basic foundations of health are rooted in glutathione like balance basically. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to say that all of those things, glutathione is what's mediating a lot of these health benefits. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You know, I noted Specifically, you shared a video on exercise and being able to support glutathione in your body. So let's talk about some particular ways through our nutrition that we can support glutathione. Um, magnesium is one that you noted. Uh, is there anything else? Yeah, definitely. Cruciferous vegetables, anything that's rich in sulfur because cysteine has sulfur in it. So it's actually the sulfur in the molecule that's doing all the work. So the more sulfur you can give your body, the more building blocks it has to create glutathione. So cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, those kinds of things, garlic, onions. So you can really give your body what it needs to maintain your glutathione levels. Cool. Now, what about, this might be surprising to people, what about whey protein? So this is interesting. I was actually looking into this because I wanted to know what are the dietary sort of interventions that we can make to increase glutathione. And one of them, interestingly enough, was whey protein. And it's it's likely because it contains the amino acids that are required to make glutathione, but it also supplies, I think, other cofactors in there. It's not fully studied, so the mechanism isn't well understood, but it does increase glutathione in people. But you've got to get a high quality whey protein. You don't want to just take any whey protein off the shelf because there's a lot of contamination with proteins and supplements in general. Yeah, for sure. Especially the supplement industry is very sketchy, as you know. And so we don't want to add to the problem. We want to get these benefits. And by the way, I was just talking about this yesterday. Hippocrates, you know, again, father of modern medicine. You know, that's what we kind of established in our popular culture. He used whey protein in his practice as well. He called It was called serum. and But it wasn't something people were necessarily drinking. They would like bathe in it for healing. You know, it's so fascinating. Like, again, this has been around for thousands of years. This isn't something new, but the way that we do things now and also what the animals are being fed or what kind of environment they're exposed to, the chemical processing, this, you know, the synthetic additives and all this stuff is creating something very different than what our ancestors might have interacted with. And so that's really cool with, and I would imagine some of these amino acids would be helping with glutathione production some kind of way yeah absolutely because yeah we need the glutamate the glycine and the cysteine 
And those are all found in whey protein. Boom. There it is. There it is. All right. So this is one of the things that we can do to make ourselves more resilient in the face of this kind of, I don't know if you remember this, it's got me thinking about the toxic Avenger from back in the day. And I don't know if have you seen this before? Oh, I don't think I've seen that guy, but I've heard of the name of the name toxic, toxic Avenger. Yeah, he's pretty much he's uh, he's exposed to a lot of toxins, you know, so he's pretty messed up. He's going around beating people up with a mop. Um, but anyways, but then we've got on the other end, we've got Captain Planet. Do you remember Captain Planet? Oh, yeah, I loved Captain Planet. <laughs> Loki, that's why you got involved. He's in our hero. <laughs> there's like um, there's a parody of of Captain Planet is played by Don Cheadle. The guy, do you know Don Cheadle? Yeah, the yeah, actor? the actor. Yeah, so yeah. We'll put that in show notes for people if it's appropriate. <laughs> but anyway, so it's just again, like these things are kind of put into our culture of avoiding toxins and looking out for the environment, but we forget that we are a part of the environment. And our regulatory bodies are, what's the best word to describe them right now? They're far behind. They're far behind where we are as far as what's getting utilized. And a lot of things are grass, you know, like generally regarded as safe. And they get a free pass into our food supply, into our environment. And we've got to be our own Avenger, our own toxic Avenger in a way, and stack conditions for ourselves. So glutathione is one of those things we could support in our bodies, make sure that we're exercising. And also I would imagine just the process of moving and sweating occasionally would be helpful as well. Yeah, definitely. Sweating is a known detox pathway. So environmental chemicals, like I mentioned, the phthalates, some heavy metals, they've all been detected in sweat. Sweat it out. So sweat it out. Key sweat. <laughs> all right. So I want to ask you about, you know, you mentioned earlier, in inhalation is like top tier way that we can change our health for the better or the not so better. You also mentioned putting things on our skin. So like topical things. And I don't think we realize that what we're putting on our skin is truly it's getting into our bodies. So let's talk about that phenomenon. Like how are things like lotions getting inside of our bodies? So when you apply stuff to your skin, it's not just necessarily sitting there. You'll apply a lotion and then a few minutes later it's gone, right? Mm. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of residue, but for the most part, it's absorbing, it's penetrating into the skin. So by technical terms, absorption means it's getting into the bloodstream. Is it always getting absorbed? We don't know but there's evidence to suggest or evidence showing in people that it does. So there's some chemicals out there, very common in beauty and personal care products, parabens and phthalates. Phthalates keep coming up, right? Because they're in plastics, they're also in beauty products, they're also in fragrances. These can penetrate the skin, get absorbed into the bloodstream, and studies have even shown that they travel to the breast and they will turn on breast cancer genes. You got, please hear that. Please hear that. It's not just staying where you applied it. Yeah. It's it's getting into your body and it's affecting your organs. And it's interesting because that study that I just mentioned, they didn't even measure cancer gene expression in other parts of the body. It was just the breast. But there's estrogen receptors everywhere, in the brain, in the ovaries, in the uterus. So I would venture to say, I wouldn't be surprised if it was activating cancer genes in those areas too. We just don't know, right? We don't know. Something's going on. Something because is Because many of these cancers are on the rise in recent decades. Breast cancer, uh, cervical cancer, brain cancer, the list goes on and mm -hmm. on of all types. And many of these different cancers we're seeing were really rare for a time period. And now it's just like an explosion, essentially. And again, it's just like, and I know you feel the same way. It isn't necessarily one thing. It's like our overall exposure that we're so kind of oblivious to in our lives today. So that's why, again, I'm very happy to have you here. Um, one of them that I'm curious about is lip care. Let's talk about, let's talk about lips. Lip products, okay, so when it comes to lip products, we need to be careful for several reasons. Number one, because you're applying products just pretty much in direct contact with your mouth, and so you're ingesting some of it, and it's also, some of it could be getting absorbed through the lips themselves. 
And over time, that can be accumulating depending on what types of ingredients you're using. So when it comes to that, be as careful as you would with your food. So what are most lip products made of? Petroleum. Petroleum that comes from crude oil. The same petroleum, that, the same starting material that will make plastic and gasoline and all these other things goes into beauty and personal care products too. But the petroleum that's used in cosmetics is highly refined. It's processed in a way that removes the majority of concerning chemicals because there are naturally occurring polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in petroleum, in crude oil. But there's evidence that even then, the amount that's left behind in these petroleum ingredients are still getting into our bodies. All right, so my question is, do we all have to be like LL Cool J out here and like, you know, <laughs> licking our lips constantly? Or is there some better alternative? There's definitely better alternatives. There's pretty much a better alternative for almost anything out there that you can think of right now. Because people are being, people are becoming aware of the issues. And so companies are creating products that are healthier and being more conscious about it, which is great, which is what we need. But if you can choose organic ingredients, for example, I've been using a grass fed tallow lip product and it's fantastic. It's edible. The more food based that you can get with your products, the better. Yeah. And just thinking about it through that lens, if you can't eat it, you probably don't want to put it on your skin or on your lips. Definitely not on your lips because <laughs> you are eating it. And by the way, shout out to LL Cool J. <laughs> by the way, I just saw him in concert. Uh, is my first concert since living in LA. The crazy thing is before I lived here, I'd come out here for some things, you know, a concert. One of them recently was like, we went to the Rose Bowls, like Beyonce and Jay-Z, it took my wife to that. But when I moved here, everything shut down. And so my first concert, my friends took me to the Forum, which is this legendary place the Lakers used to play. And it was LL Cool J and oh, man, he's on, he's, he's different. He's different, he's 55. And he was out of this world fit, like crazy, crazy. And just the stamina, he did two full sets of performances, like one, cause he's got a huge catalog of songs and like his, his voice, he didn't miss a beat running around the stage, jumping up and down. It's just like the, the energy, the stamina, the, the fitness. And, you know, some other folks came out, you know, it was like one of those things where somebody will pop out here or there, a couple other people do sets. Um, but he did two full sets and also the Roots Band was playing the back background tracks for every song. It was like salt and pepper and like, because they're in LA, like they had Ice-T came out and did some stuff. And, um, but the Roots played all of those tracks. There was a guy holding a tuba for like 70 <laughs> songs, by the way. It's just like, man, these guys are out here training there like that. And, um, but I just wanted to give him a shout out. And again, like we can see what's possible because for him, was one of the things, he, he even had a fitness book that came out maybe like 10 years ago. Dedication to certain lifestyle practices can turn out much better results. Because you could see the distinction in his age group in the rapper community between where he's at and where other people are at. Like, are you making this a consistent part of your life? And also just knowing too, we're going to be exposed to things, we're gonna be exposed to environments, we're gonna be ex exposed to toxicity. How resilient are we? And let's take action to minimize our exposure to the best of our abilities. Which leads me to one of my favorite songs from L Cool J, which is doing it, doing it well. Let's talk about our bedroom. Let's talk about our sheets and our bedding in particular. And pillows. Yeah, okay, so pillows, of course, we're laying our heads directly on them. They are in direct contact with our breathing zone. And what's happening there is if you're using a foam pillow, it's releasing volatile organic compounds, formaldehyde, benzene, polyurethane foam. That's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, the ones that you can get with all the chopped up leftover pieces from the mattress industry. You don't wanna be breathing that stuff in eight to 10 hours a night, however long people sleep, but babies can sleep up to 13 hours a night and their bodies are so tiny. They cannot metabolize any of these. They can't detoxify this kind of stuff. So be really careful with the kind of pillow that you're using. Organic is ideal. Again, going back to the basics, what did our ancestors used to sleep on? Like feather pillows, cotton, just really simple, simple swaps. Awesome. And what about our bedding? Oh, the bedding. It's the same situation. The polyurethane foam mattresses, those are everywhere. They use a lot of 
So a lot of these chemicals are being released when you lay on them. So your body weight and your body heat is causing these chemicals to volatilize. You're breathing them in. If you sleep with someone that tosses and turns a lot, you're going to get more exposure. Mm. You know, this is one of the things that I did for myself early on, uh, just kind of investing in me and investing in like creating a really good sleep environment. And I upgraded the sheets that I was using and this awesome company I found out about and they, instead of kind of conventional stuff grown, you know, a lot of even with cotton, it's, you know, sprayed with all these variety of chemicals and whatnot. And they were using organic bamboo lyocell for their sheets. And it was actually like softer than Egyptian cotton. You know, when you start talking about the thread counts and all this stuff. And I didn't know about this stuff. Like I'm from, I'm from the hood. Like I didn't care about thread count, but when I slept on them, I couldn't believe it. It was like, slipping into a love song it was like so nice and they're also they were moisture wicking antimicrobial hypoallergenic and the company just ran a uh randomized controlled trial as well and like i think it was like 20 percent better sleep quality and like more better cognitive function the next day for people sleeping on them and 94 percent of people preferred sleeping on them as well and I'm talking about attitude, which I'm going to get you some, matter of fact. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting you some attitude sheets as my gift for coming all the way here and hanging out with us today. So, and by the way, if you want to get some attitude sheets, go to attitude.com forward slash model. That's E-T-T-I-T-U-D-E dot com forward slash model. You get 10% off. And also, this is a great gift. We're getting close to the holiday season as well. I'm. A, this is my probably my top in my top three of gifts that i give people that i care about i love because it's just an upgrade once you sleep on these sheets you don't want to sleep on anything else and so yeah attitude.com forward slash model for 10 percent off and we've talked about betting we've talked about plastics in our environment we talked a little bit about personal care but for many of us we're going like head to toe with stuff all right we we talked about the lips what about things that we're cleansing our bodies with? Let's talk about that, like hair care products, shampoos, and soaps. So we also need to be careful here because the skin on our body's different areas will absorb chemicals differently. So the scalp will absorb more than maybe other parts of your body because there's a lot of blood flow there. There's a lot of hair follicles. So being very conscious about the products that you're using on your hair. But if you're using something like a body lotion, something that covers your in, like entire surface of your body that's going to be a higher risk type of product just simply because of the amount that you're using and the fact that it sits on your skin. So shampoo, I definitely would recommend trying to get as organic as possible there too. And there's a lot of great companies out there that are doing really, really, really amazing products that work just as well as the conventional counterparts. All right. now. Even hearing about this and these kind of upgrades, and you know, what about cost? A lot of this stuff, doesn't it cost more? Yes, generally speaking, the less processed, the more wholesome, the more organic products will cost more because generally they come from plants instead of petroleum. Petroleum is dirt cheap. They can synthesize tons, literally metric tons of this stuff for pennies, like not fractions of a penny. But it, to create something from a plant takes time, it takes energy. So it's going to cost more. But in the end, you can weigh out the cost benefit analysis of investing in your health with healthier products. Or do you want to go another route and have to invest in your health, you know, later on down the line with medical care? Mm -hmm. It should sound like a no brainer, you know, but it's just, again, in for the average person being able to figure out where they can make that investment. And, you know, again, coming from where I came from, I was in that situation where sometimes like literally light bill or Whole Foods, you know, like I'm like measuring and I'd be at the checkout counter like, I hope that this goes through kind of thing so many times during this during this time period. But the interesting thing that happened at, is as I was investing more in my health and I started feeling better and I had more clarity and more energy not only did I start to make more income so I can afford more things, but the crazy thing is now, like a lot of the companies that I was buying things from, 
I know the people like they're my friends and they'll send me stuff and just like things that I once had to buy. I don't even necessarily have to buy anymore. You know, it's just like when you invest in certain things and just kind of alter your perception in your world, make it a kind of healthier universe for yourself and your family. We can't even understand the good ways that, you know, the stuff starts to repay itself in our lives. And so that's one of the encouragements today, because I know that some of this stuff and, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, is there anything else you want to add? Because, again, this is a lot like for parents that are concerned about some of these things and exposures. Is there anything that else that you could share with them? Yeah, I would I would recommend starting with the products that you're using on your kids. Focus on helping your kids because they have lot, a lot longer to live. They can't detoxify the way we can. So any amount of help that you can give them is going to go a long way. And you don't have to go out and replace all your products at once. That's going to create a lot of waste too. We don't necessarily want to do that. But just making a more conscious decision the next time, even if it's 1% better, that's still better than it was. Mm -hmm. And one easy way is just to go fragrance free. You'll save a lot of money like that. A lot of people are out there drinking their Starbucks in these plastic cups that are melting into our drinks, burning these expensive candles, buying these expensive hair products. You don't even need that. It's, you can go really, really basic mm -hmm. and get what you still need at a fraction of the cost and you're saving yourself a whole lot of toxic load. Mm, I love it. I love it. All right. So I've got to ask you about this as well. How do we know? Like, how can we trust that a company is actually looking out for our best interests you know can we just take people at their own kind of discretion saying hey this is uh certified safe or hypoallergenic or whatever the case is what about things like credibility transparency third-party testing let's talk about that a little bit so at this point, since our products are so polluted, our environment's polluted, all of this is affecting the products that we buy. And we can't necessarily take it at face value, unfortunately. So looking beyond just what's on the marketing and really asking the company, hey, if you're making these claims, can you back it up? So I recently did a diaper investigation and I went on all these websites and I was looking at diapers that are marketed as non-toxic. And I asked them, hey, if you're claiming that it's, you know, phthalate free, PVC free, all of these things, do you have some way to back this up? Out of 30 diaper brands that I contacted, only three could substantiate their claims. That's 10, 90% yeah. are not able to validate their claims. So really at this point, we have to look for companies that not only can substantiate their claims, but are transparent with it, are willing to share these test reports. You have to test to know. There's no way to just make that claim because products are made with ingredients from all different vendors and sources and manufacturers. And you're just taking their word for it as a, you know, a maker, then you're just trusting them that they're being transparent with what they're saying. And oftentimes it's not the case because there's things happening upstream of them that they didn't know about either. So you've got to do the testing as for me, if I was to make a product, I would test it third party tested. So it's not done in house. There's no bias. Someone else is doing the test. And then I give you the report. I show you, hey, this is these are the numbers. If I'm saying this is a clean product, here are the numbers to back it up. The transparency is huge now. It's For me, it's the bare minimum now. Mm, yeah, yeah. Because again, a lot of marketers will use these things, these kind of uh, public awareness of certain things and health wash it, use it as, you know, and it just the crazy thing is, unless you're getting a powerful legal force behind you, they could just do that and they're never going to suffer any consequences to say that it's, you know, dilate free and, you know, uh, whatever. They could just say certain things, but it doesn't necessarily have to be true. They don't have to prove it. Right. And right now, this is why I'm a huge advocate of like, if you find good companies to really support them, companies that are doing, you know, really good, good work. And there are so many more of them are, are emerging for sure. And I think we're going to reach a tipping point at some point, but we've also got to vote with our dollar. We've got to invest and say yes to better things. And also that's where the economy of scales and like different things can start to change where the price comes down for certain things as well, because petroleum is cheap because it's really been, it's, it's been integrated into a system that makes it cheap. It's a very kind of cost intensive thing to be able to extract from the earth you know, but systems were put in place because humans began to value that, right? And 
you know, this is just, we're at a very interesting time, but we need to get educated. And this is why, again, I want people to follow you. And is there anywhere else that people can stay up to date with you besides following you on social media? Yeah, actually, um, you can follow me on YouTube. I've started making videos there. I love making long form content to really delve in very deeply on one topic at a time. But you can also find products that I personally had vetted at the Swell Score, which is an online wellness platform, curated products from doctors and scientists. I'm the head toxicologist. I'm personally curating and handpicking beauty and personal care products. And my standards are the strictest in the entire industry. And so we've coined it ultra clean because clean beauty is like you said, it's green washed, health washed. It can be deceptive because not all products that are claiming to be clean are actually clean. But I can vouch, I've vetted all of these products. I've got the test reports. I've spoken with the manufacturers, with the owners, the suppliers. So these are fully vetted products I trust and use myself. And you can find them all in one place, which is amazing. So you don't have to go searching piecemeal. So awesome. Thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. So that's Swell Score. And also they have a social media platform that you can follow there. Is there a website people can go to as well? Yeah, definitely. It's theswellscore.com theswellscore.com so definitely go there get educated and you do yeah your standards are very high which is a little scary you know because just like if it doesn't meet her approval i've got to check myself and be honest like you know this is not up to par and because you're looking out for us and also again at the end of the day it's making even you just said it one percent improvement is an improvement we don't have to change everything at once but we need to learn about this stuff so thank you so much for doing this work it's just like i'm so grateful that you are out here and being a champion for us it's it's really amazing yeah thank you so much uh it's my passion and i feel obligated to share this information because once you become aware of it i have to take action i have to tell people yeah yeah so final question before i let you go what is the model that you're here to set for other people, for other families, for other parents with the way that you live your life personally? Is being conscious and aware about what we are bringing into our homes and what we are feeding our children and our families and the legacy that we wanna leave behind. Do we wanna make the world a better place? I wanna leave it less toxic than it was when I got here. I love it, I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Yvonne Burkhardt, everybody. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Not only are we damaging our gut bacteria by eating horrible foods with high sugar and preservatives, emulsifiers, etc., we're also putting them in a dark place for over 24 hours where they don't know what night and day is and they're dying off that way.